the students, they're looking for a path. They're looking for guidance. They want mentorship. They want to be given a path to where they can go and say, this is how you're going to be successful. This is how I'm going to help you. And some business owners aren't willing to do that. They just want them to come in and be an employee and say, hey, just show up every day and get your job done. And our students are looking for more than that. So super excited for the podcast today. We have Justin Weedman on with us. Welcome, Justin. Hey, thanks, Brad. Appreciate you having me. Oh, I'm super excited about this episode. So Justin, he's the under, undergraduate coordinator and teaching professor of the construction and facilities management programs there at Brigham Young University at BYU. And uh, Justin and I were classmates many years ago. And now he's one of the main guys running the show back uh, with all the students there. So excited to have you on. Yeah, thank you. I had a great time in, in class with Brad, and now I get to invite him back to be a guest speaker. <laughs> I, I tell my students, other ones of my classmates went out and did great things, and I'm in, still in the same room. So. <laughs> that is, well, I did forget one of his titles, too, because he's also uh, uh, Mr. Flag Football, too. I think you guys had a big game last night, a playoff game. So Yeah, we did. We were in the semifinals, and we ended up pulling it out in double overtime. I, I'm 42 years old. The rest of the league is about 21. <laughs> they, they turned me on guard, the old man, guard, the old man. And last night I had our two touchdowns in regulation. So, wow, look at you worked out pretty good. So you like Travis Kelsey or just bodying him and just creating space, huh? I got a wicked spin <clears throat> move that surprises them. <laughs> so Oh, that's amazing, Justin. Well, I'm excited to have you on. And, you know, it's pretty neat. We're going to take a unique perspective from the from the college, right? From college, university, the education route, and how that plays into construction. And I know he, you have a unique perspective because I know Justin says it lightly, but he's worked for some pretty big firms, you know, out in the construction industry that some of us know, and I'm sure you could speak about. So you have a lot of expertise, not only in the classroom, but also in real life. Um, maybe I'll start here, Justin, businesses such as myself, you know, there's a lot of companies. I mean, hiring is a big concern, a big challenge, you know, the talent that's out there. A lot of builders have never looked at maybe hiring and recruiting out of CM, you know, construction management programs out of college. You know, what are some of the benefits that you see from those that come recruit to you and, and the students you have? So some of the major benefits is you're getting, um, talent that is excited about learning, excited about growing. Um, they, they come and they learn how to learn. And so sometimes it's not always the technical expertise that they're leaving with, but they're learning communication skills. They're learning how to please a client. I tell our students all the time that even when they're taking general education courses that they might never use, you know, in terms of history or physics, that they're not using day to day, I, I tell them you're learning how to please a client. You're learning how to meet expectations of somebody that isn't just what you expect. And so being able to learn that's a valuable skill. They're learning how to interact with others. They're learning how to build their network. Um, and they're learning how to learn different software. Sometimes they bring that type of knowledge into a company to where not necessarily that they come in as experts in software, but they are technology literate, right? They've grown up in this environment to where they are adaptable to implementing new technologies, new softwares, and being able to figure those things out quickly um, and being able to put those into play. Have, have you seen that change over the years? I know predominantly many programs throughout the country cater to commercial construction, right? Have mm -hmm. you seen that change where now whether it be subcontractors that recruit or, or students leave to start subcontracting businesses, work in residential, whether custom or production, kind of how, how does that work for the demographic for students as they, they leave, you know, as alumni? So, so our alumni, uh, the way that our program's been built is that we've tried to make it uh, very general so that anybody can be successful no matter what field they go into. Um, when I first kind of went through the program with you, Brad, it was very heavy, probably production residential. Uh, then it shifted kind of with the market into commercial. 
uh, our students end up going all different routes. Um, as I've looked at some of our graduates and where they end up, um, a lot of them end up, you know, going to get further education. Um, a colleague of ours is a director of finance at Adobe. And another one is a chief marketing officer at another technology company. And so it just kind of gives them an overall good degree. But as they're coming out, um, they're looking at new opportunities. So they're looking for places where they can grow and that they can make an impact. I, I think more than anything, this generation isn't just looking for um, employment necessarily. Right. When historically people have come to college and they said, I'm just going to school so that I can get a job and I'm going to work in that job for the rest of my career and then I'm going to retire. I think students in this generation come out with more, uh, more ideas of they want to be a change maker. They want to be able to be informed and feel like they're really contributing to an organization. And so if they can find that in a subcontracting firm to where maybe their systems and processes aren't as refined and they can come in and make a difference, that's really exciting to our students. And same thing in smaller companies where they feel like what they do will make a difference as opposed to coming out and just being a number and saying, well, we just need a spot filled, so we're going to fill it. Oh, it's a really good perspective, and I, I, I can relate to the learning aspect. I mean, we've been fortunate to hire a few students out of college, and you know, we have right now, currently, I have from uh, BYU, I have Georgia Southern, and I have ASU, and they have a unique perspective. I mean, like any profession, of course, there's on-field training and application and you know, th that's going to come no matter what, because you don't know what you don't know. And there's levels right. of, you know, complication with any bill. But but at the core of it, the to what you're speaking about, Justin, is the intimidation factor. They're not intimidated, right? So mm -hmm. the new programs, processes that we're rolling out, implementing, you know, they're pretty quick to to grab on to. Um, how, how have you seen the, call it the, the student, the students change. You and I were in college together 20 years ago. You've been there teaching for how long now since you've been back? Uh, this is my 12th year now here. Yeah, so you've seen many the, the, the groups go through the last 12 years. Technology's mm -hmm. changed, social media's changed. With the talent you have now, I know I was just back there with you when we when speaking with a few other builders, but looking at who you have now from a talent aspect, you know, how does the student now compare to maybe prior generations and, you know, pros and cons of both? Yeah, so I think prior generations probably had a little bit stronger technical skills in terms of field experience coming into the program. Um, they'd worked with their, their family businesses, they'd worked through high school um, on framing crews, and, you know, with some of the labor laws to where you can't have high school kids necessarily on construction sites unless it's with their family business. Uh, we're seeing less technical skills in terms of uh, the actual putting construction in place. And so I would say that's the biggest learning curve for our students is having to be patient learning those skills on the job site because they're very capable on the software side. They can pick that up uh, much faster than we could and they can evaluate new technology, they can implement it, they're used to you know, getting new apps on their phones and so, and playing with those things. But I would say the biggest change that I've seen is the hands-on technical skills of how to just be a builder. And I think some of the students struggle with patience in knowing that they have to go and put in the time to learn how to build properly. Um, that's, that's a real challenge. And the analogy that I've heard is it's kind of like being a pilot. Um, you can learn how to fly pretty quickly, but there's no substitute for time in the chair, um, in terms of becoming a certified pilot and somebody that you would trust and, and put out there to protect other people's lives. You have to have that time in the chair. You might have the technical abilities to be a project manager and to manage budgets and, and schedules. But if you don't know how to build, you're really at a disadvantage. And so sometimes I think the patience of this generation 
because everything has been instant for them. Um, information comes so quickly and they're able to access everything so quickly. It's hard to say, well, I've got to, I've got to learn how to build for five years before I can really be effective. And do you see that a lot? I, I notice that there's a lot. Do you feel that the program caters to entrepreneurs more? And the reason I say that is because you kind of gave this example that a lot of them, and, and I think most of us are that way. We're pretty impatient people. And I think the pilot's mm -hmm. a great example that I look at myself now when I came out of college to kind of, you know, what my understanding of the business was or understanding of construction to where I'm now, totally different. And mm -hmm. sitting in the chair, if you were being in a certain role for a long time, you kind of get, you know, understanding and confidence and other aspects of the business. But going back to the original question here is that, you know, the students, um, it, it, all of us deal with impatience, but a lot of them are programmed to be entrepreneurs. I've, you know, when we're there speaking, so many of them are like, I'm ready to do my own business. And the funny thing is when I was in school 20 years ago, I don't think I was thinking that I'd own my own business. I never thought mm -hmm. that I was just thinking, and maybe that's just a generation thing that's changed with some of the younger generation about what they see from social media and just opportunities that are out there. Yeah. Um, I think they're eager, right? I think they want to own their own business. Um, BYU, uh, is a high caliber university. And so the, the types of kids that we get at this university are leaders. They're, they've been leaders in their school. They are goal oriented, they're driven, and they have excelled in their academics and they see what their potential is. And so they look at it and they see, you know, with social media, like, wow, look at this opportunity. I could do that. And so they've been told that they can achieve great things and they're definitely capable of it. Um, and as, as they go out, um, I think more of them want to be entrepreneurs than are willing to take the risk. And that risk is a little bit scary because they don't realize what they don't know and how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. And, and so I kind of tell them there's a few schools of thought that the students come out with is, well, maybe I'm going to go work for somebody for a few years and then I'm going to start my own company. And others will say, well, I'm just going to start right away. And the benefit of going to work for somebody is you're, you're learning on, on their dollar and you're learning, you know, how to learn and grow. But the disadvantage of that is you get comfortable in that position. And for some of our students who might be married, they might have to tell their spouse, hey, I know we've been getting benefits and working and a good salary for the last five years. Now we're going to go make nothing. Um, <laughs> and, and that really inhibits them going out and actually starting it. And so I tell them, I said, if you're willing to do it, now's a great time because you're young enough to fail and you have the opportunity to have energy while you're young. You can work as many hours as you need to. You can work at night. You can put your children to bed if you have children and and keep working and putting in those hours and learning. And then if you fail, you can still recover. And so I think there's different thoughts there as they go through, but they're definitely capable. And, and many of them have those aspirations um, and seeing that I could do something great and I could run this type of business. And some don't realize that maybe running the business or owning the business isn't necessarily what they want they want to be in a position that affects a business and makes change. And some of them learn that later on to where maybe becoming a vice president or a business unit leader gives them the same fulfillment, but without the same obligations as a business owner. I think that's really a really good point you made because, you know, a couple moments ago, you were speaking about that some of the students may have an understanding of what entrepreneurship looks like, but it may change, right? When they're in that, mm -hmm. working for that company. And it's funny because I, I look at this now with AFT and we weren't in a position to do this years ago. I mean, now it's a little bit different, but you know, we have six employees right now that own their own business. Like they own their own company, successful companies, you know, and it's tough. It's really tough running a business. It's, there's so many elements to being a business owner outside of just building, you know, as we relate it to construction and 
for a lot of different circumstances to just the complication of business and industry and market and all these different aspects, you know, fortunately we've, they've come on board and they're here to stay. And so there's a commitment there. And, and, and I've gone back and forth with other builders about this because I'm a huge proponent of hiring out of universities, right? I think there's a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. We hire inside and outside. I mean, we hire people that aren't from the university either, right? It's not like this right. is a minimum standard to work for us, but you can find value and talent all throughout the industry in many different areas. And what's interesting is that I think part of this is how we onboard them and the culture and the other things that we bring in, because as you mentioned, if they can make a difference, some business owners are scared to say, okay, Justin, well, if I come recruit up to the students at BYU, well, they're only going to be with me a couple of years and they're off to the races, right? So mm -hmm. some of it may be expectations. Some of it may be how we're setting up our business. What are students looking for? When you've seen companies successfully recruit out of college, what is their onboarding process or what are things they do that help them retain the talent that they're chasing? Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a worry for a lot of companies. I've, I've heard companies say, oh, I won't hire out of, of this school because they're looking for too much or, um, and it really depends on what the company's looking for. You know, if they're looking for somebody to just come in and fill a spot, um, then they might be disappointed when a somebody that's goal driven and that wants to progress ends up leaving. Uh, but the students, what they're looking for is they're looking for a path. They're looking for guidance. They want mentorship. They want to be given a path to where they can go and say, this is how you're going to be successful. This is how I'm going to help you. And some business owners aren't willing to do that. They just want them to come in and be an employee and say, hey, just show up every day and get your job done. And our students are looking for more than that. And I think that's a generational thing to where they say, I want to be in where you're at, right? I want to move up. I want to be told I'm doing a good job. And so recognition is a big thing. And it doesn't always have to be monetary recognition. Employees need to feel wanted and they need to feel appreciated to where they will stay at a company because of who they are working for. Um, it's often said that employees don't often quit their jobs, they quit their bosses. And so having a boss that takes care of an employee and mentors them and says, hey, here's how you're doing, you're doing great on this, that's a really good thing for employers to do for new employees coming out, especially from college, especially if they don't have those technical skills, they wanna have that guidance. And being able to be shown a path to success and then having transparency is important as well. If they're not getting feedback, they're going to feel like they're not appreciated and that they don't want to stay. But if they're having regular feedback and, and having positive experiences, that's where I see the employers are doing a good job keeping and retaining employees is by focusing on training. And some, some employers will say, well, I don't want to spend the money to train them because they're going to leave. Well, training's an investment. What happens if you don't train them and they stay? And, <laughs> and, and that's a real problem, right? And so if you train them and they leave, you've made the industry better. And that's a, that's a good thing, right? You've made your company better and you've made the industry better and you should be okay with that. Sorry, I... You got me on that one, Justin. I've I've heard some great I've heard some great quotes on this podcast in in the previous four years. But when you said you know the investment in training, and they're you know an employer's talking about well what happens when they leave, and you're like well what happens if they stay? It just immediately you know this light switch goes on that at the end of the day, um, you know as a company to be successful, you have to have good training, good systems, good organization, right? You should always be building. And you're right. Sometimes people come on, uh, fit, opportunity, whatever. There's going to be different circumstances that lead to, you know, change in employment. But mm -hmm. at the core of it to what you're teaching, I mean, this is a core element for any business that's running a successful business. If you have really good training and onboarding, those people that do stay, now you're going to have the upper hand because now you have systems in place mm -hmm. and that retention, they're going to get better and, 
you're going to be able to serve your client better, which now opens up new business opportunities and new development opportunities and, you know, ideal client opportunities, which is what we're all looking for. Yeah. And, and people want to feel fulfilled. Right. And so I don't know if you're familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so what that is, is we all have needs as people, right? And the basic needs, it's, it's type of pyramid to where the bottom base layer of the pyramid is physiological needs. We all need food, shelter, safety, security, right? We're, we're in that standpoint of being able to just, if we don't have those things, we can't function properly, right? We're so worried about what's going to happen. If I can't afford to live in a house and I don't have shelter for my family, that's all I can think about, right? And that's all I'm going to be. And so if I'm in a job that's underpaying me and I can't even provide for the basic needs, I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to do a good job. I'm, I'm only worried about that. And then you get into, you know, the next level up is personal security and that's employment, having your needs taken care of, being able to, you know, pay your bills and get, get that type of thing going on. And then you get to that next level, which is love and belonging to where that's your friendship. That's your community. That's feeling like I've got coworkers that I love to go to work with. Um, that's something that I love about the job that I have. I love my coworkers. Like coming to work is just like going home for me. I, I would love to hang out with the people I, I work with just as much as I do my family. And so that's a great thing where we, we have that connection. And if we have that connection at work, we're, we're feeling more fulfilled as we go up and then you get up into esteem, right? That's the next level on the pyramid to where, um, you've got respect, right? You feel respected at work. You feel like you're, you're creating value and that, uh, you have status and recognition saying, yeah, I've, I've arrived. Like I'm a project manager or I'm, I'm an executive here. I've, I've got this esteem that I've built and I'm, I'm feeling good. And then the top level is actually self-actualization. That's becoming who you are meant to be or who you can be. Right. And being able to get people to that level to say, you can become who you want. Right. And, and what can we do to make you happy? And it's not always money, right? I was working with a uh, home builder that has actually been home builder of the year a couple of times. And I was training their project management staff. And there was a comment made um, that one of the project managers had been there 15 years and, and had done a really good job. And he didn't always feel appreciated. He said, you know what, like what would really mean a lot to me is if one of my executives came and said, you know what, why don't you take your wife up to Park City and here's a gift card for Ruth's Chris, take her out to dinner and we'll put you up for a hotel in a night. That would mean more to me than a five or $10,000 bonus, right? To show that they care and that they're grateful, that they're they're appreciative of the work that I've done for them over the last 15 years. And he says, it's not about the money. It's, it's about, I want to be a part of the business. I want to be a part of creating change and feeling like I've, I've done something and made a difference. And that's, that's where everybody wants to get to, right? They want to get to that self-actualization to where they feel like I am who I want to be and I'm making a difference and I, and I love it. Do you feel that's giving you a unique advantage, especially as your professor speaking, you know, running the program, one of the key components around the program up there, as you're speaking to students, speaking about, you know, exactly what you just did here on the podcast, having worked, you know, been in college, having worked for a company, um, having consulted for other builders, and now, you know, how has that changed your perspective being on both sides of it? Um, just being able to see. Um, so I, I still feel like my education is fresh of how I felt when I was going through the program and what I was looking for, but also being able to see the students going through the same experience in terms of what they're looking for. I can let them know um, 
So for example, when they're getting offers from companies, I often tell them they're, they're impatient. They're, they're like, I haven't heard back from them. It's been three days. <laughs> and, and I say, well, you are your first priority. You are not their first priority right now right? Because they're running a business, they've got other things going on, they might be interviewing other candidates. And so you want that answer right now, so you can help make decisions. But helping them to see that, listen, like, they've got other responsibilities that they're trying to take care of. And they do want you to be successful. And when they bring you on, they want you to be a part of that team, but they've got other things going on. So you have to be patient. And you have to look at these opportunities that they're going to provide and, and say, what's going on? I also let students know that when they go and they start working and they see their bosses that are, you know, driving a new truck and doing these things, they're like, well, how come they're only paying me this much money? I say, well, you haven't taken any risk, right? Their mortgage is on the line if they can't make payroll, right? They've got this cash flow problem that they've, you just collect a check every week. They've got to worry about how that check's going to get paid. And so being able to help them realize that um, businesses have to take care of employees and it takes a lot to get there. Um, So helping students realize that and then helping companies see as well, here's what people are looking for, right? So as I did that consulting uh, with this home builder, it was very interesting for me to go between the executives and the uh, project managers because the executives might say, well, we need our project managers to negotiate better. And so I would go and talk to the project managers and I say, well, tell me about your negotiating. And they say, well, we don't have any authority to negotiate. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. And then I would go back to the executives and say, what authority have you given these project managers to negotiate. And they're like, well, I I guess we haven't really given them any, right? And so being able to see from a middle person's perspective has been really valuable to me to kind of share with both sides, um, executives and and employee sides and students and employer side, being able to share kind of what their experience, because I think sometimes when we're in the employer seat, we forget what it was like being on the other side. I, I think that's the case for many of us, right? I mean, anytime it, 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 you, your, your current experience is put together by your current situation and current mm-hmm. experiences, and that's real time for us, right? And we forget, hey, what was it like 10 years ago or 15 years ago was when I was an employee, not the employer, and what was it that motivated me? Um, f- from, from your aspect, Justin, especially with the students now, how are you preparing them, you know, from class, like the classes that they take? You mentioned that they come out, you know, tech savvy, they're ready to learn. What are some of those core classes that they're learning that not only prepare them for the industry, but also for, as you mentioned, topics outside the industry that, you know, adapt to learn and be taught and leadership mm-hmm. roles? Yeah. So some of the classes that, that we've offered in our program, our um, lower level classes are are kind of introducing them to some of the trades, um, kind of the building processes. And then as you get into the upper level, we have construction law, we have real estate development, we have company management operations, we have project management, scheduling, estimating, and we, we weave leadership into all of these courses. Um, we, we weave understanding and perspective and saying, hey, listen, what would you do in this situation? And we try and provide some case studies and other opportunities for them to look at not just what the technical skill is, uh, but being able to say, what is, what's the why behind why we're doing things? And so that's what we try and really focus on because a lot of the technical knowledge, and I we were talking about this yesterday in my project management class, we we're talking about technology and new technologies that are coming into the industry that companies are always on the lookout for what's new and when are we going to implement new technology and what are the challenges of implementing new technology 
And as we talked about that, I say, I told the students, we always in education have to balance teaching technology versus teaching principles. Because if we go too hard on say, we're going to teach this technology and in five years, that technology is going to be obsolete. Then we haven't done the students a good service, right? We've taught them how to learn technology and there's some capabilities that they can learn to where they might feel a little proficient going in the industry. But some, some students like for Bluebeam, for example, are like, oh, I wish we could learn more Bluebeam. I said, you're going to learn more Bluebeam on the first two weeks of your job than you're going to learn <laughs> in my class. I promise you. But I'm going to introduce you to what Bluebeam is and the capabilities so that you can see that there's tools out there that will make you better. The software is not going to make you a better project manager. The software might make you a more efficient and productive project manager, but it's not going to take your skills and create them out of nothing. I love that you shared that. It made me think back of my experience. So when I then when I was there, of course, we take scheduling. That was one of the core classes. That was one of my favorite ones. And yeah, we got some training and I want to say, was it P3 or sure track? I don't sure track. Yeah. yeah, sure track, I, I believe, is what we did many years ago. And to your point, like with Bluebeam, yeah, there was some training on that. Um, same with CAD and Revit at the time. Mm -hmm. But at the core of it, I remember that knew it who was teaching that he he really taught us like predecessor successor like how to build a mm -hmm. schedule right when you talk about technology may change but do you know how to build a house from front to back do you know how to schedule right. it and I, I i learned so much in that class and i remember being out of college for the first year i was doing production homes you know that's what i did at the time it was 2005 so it's kind of busy market and i wanted to go do customs that was always kind of my thing and a company was hiring in 2006 uh, 10 months out of college and my, this is what my job interview consisted of. <clears throat> they bring me in, and I'm sitting there with the director of operations and the owner of the company, and we sat down, and they're interviewing a ton of people for the position. And the owner says, okay, Brad, he pulls up Microsoft Project, and he says, build me a schedule, uh, you know, how to build a custom home. And so I just started building it right there. It's like 15 minutes, you know. It takes longer mm -hmm. to build a schedule, but for 15 minutes, I started building, you know, the, you know, the first few phases of the schedule, and he said, okay, you're hired. And... That was it. I didn't go through my resume. It wasn't this Q&A. Just show me the practicality of what I need for you to perform in this role. And that opened the door to, again, working, doing that hotel, and then started my company years later. But at the core of it, I think the value there, Justin, that you're doing for these students and what was done for me, because truth be told, I learned a lot in project management in these classes that, for those listening, Justin's dad was my professor and had a huge impact on me when I was at the university. Brent Weedman did, and I look at a dear friend and had a huge impact just on leadership and outlook and you know how I view business. And so there's a lot of core things I learned in college that are applicable now. Um, maybe from just, I don't wanna say the selfish side, but maybe the part that gives you passion for your job. What does that look like for you now that you've been here 12 years, you have students come back and visit, students you've taught, you know, how, how does that play a role just in your day-to-day, -day, just seeing the impact you've made on, on so many kids and students? Um, for me, that's, that's one of the most rewarding things probably is to see students come back. And a lot of times they come back acting as recruiters for their companies. <laughs> but to be able to have them come back to campus and to see that you've made some type of difference in them in their career um, and a lot of times when when companies come they might say i don't care what these kids know um, i met with a company that's building the salt lake airport and they they mentioned listen we know that you're not going to teach these students how to be schedulers in a three credit scheduling class we don't expect them to be able to know very much Right. They, they understand what a predecessor and successor is, but we will teach them scheduling. We want hungry, humble kids that are going to come out and be willing to learn and put in work. And as students go out and do that, and then as they come back and they're starting to progress in their careers and be promoted and they come back and talk about some of the things that they learned in class and they feel connected to the program, 
that's some of my biggest rewards. Um, and uh, randomly getting texts from students, whether it's on my birthday or just random times throughout the year saying, hey, how are things going? Um, I, I went golfing with a couple of students this summer and they had called me up and said, hey, let's go golfing. And I thought, I asked them the question. I said, how many of your friends call their professors to go golf? And they're like, none of them. I was like, do your friends think you're weird that you're calling your professor? Um, and the culture that we have in our program, it doesn't feel weird. Um, it's, it's happened many times and, and it's an opportunity to where just being a part of their lives. And what I would say is I don't expect my students to remember a whole lot of the technical things that we talk about in class. I talk about so much more in class. And I learned this from my dad as he was our professor. He would talk about experiences raising kids. Um, when I talk about quality, I actually share an experience where I had my eight-year-old son build a birdhouse. And I was trying to teach him some lessons of just grit because he would get so frustrated. He would start something like learning to tie a shoe and he just start crying and i'm like why are you crying i don't know i don't know <laughs> and i'm like you've tried twice like you gotta keep trying and he's like well i can't do it and i said well you've only tried twice you gotta go you gotta try a hundred times before you can cry right and and usually it would be three times before he'd start crying so i was like all right <laughs> we got to do something different here so i said you're gonna build a birdhouse and so I went down to Home Depot and I got a, a one by eight board and I said, okay, here's your board. You're going to build a birdhouse. What pieces do you need? So he had to draw it out, just really basic. And then I gave him a handsaw and he had to cut all the pieces out by hand. And I showed him how to clamp it to the table and it would take him probably an hour to cut each board. And, but I just, I wanted to teach him some grit and, and some perseverance. And so he got all those pieces cut out. And then when he did that, I, I was coaching high school tennis, uh, as an assistant for a little bit on the side. And I went to a tournament and I told my wife, okay, he needs to put this birdhouse together today and he can't watch college football until he's got it. Right. And so she calls me up a few hours later while I'm at this tournament and said, he's been out there for hours. He's crying. He hasn't, doesn't have any of the pieces together. <laughs> and, and I said, all right, well, don't let him watch it till I get home. I'll come help. So I get home and I realized that I had failed. I gave him some pretty crummy nails to, to try and put this thing together that weren't going to hold anyways. Um, and so I, I then taught him about, um, I was like, okay, I'll let you screw this thing together. And so I taught him how to pre-drill and then I taught him how to screw and I was sitting there watching him and he, he ended up putting a piece that was, he had the floor and he put one of the walls and the wall wasn't flush at all. It was flush on one end and totally skew on the other. And my son's name is Cougar um, after the BYU Cougars. And I said, Cougar, you got two options. You can either leave this wall the way it is or you can take the screw out and fix it. And he says, uh, I think I'll just leave it. <laughs> and I said, okay, Cougar, then I wouldn't ever hire you to do a job. And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, that's not good quality. I wouldn't hire somebody that's going to give me poor quality. And so you're not going to get very many jobs doing if you're going to have quality like this. And he's like, oh, okay, I'll fix it. And so he fixed it and then he starts trying to put pieces together and he's got two walls up like this and the floor. And then he's trying to put the top piece on in between the two side pieces and he's trying to go and it keeps dropping down. Right. And I'm, I'm just watching him to see how's he going to figure this problem out. I want him to learn how to solve problems. And he keeps dropping. And I said, Hey, Cougar, do you know what gravity is? Like, yeah. And so I was like, well, tell me what gravity is. Right. And so I told him, I finally helped him figure out that if you put that piece on the ground, 
it'll stay on the ground and you can flip the thing over and screw in the sides to that top piece. And he was going through some other challenges to, to put this together. And I said, Cougar, do you know what it means when you hear the term? Have you ever heard the term? There's lots of ways to skin a cat. No. Okay. Well, if you're going to take the skin off a cat, what would you do? He says, well, uh, where would you start? I don't know the tail. Okay, great. Could you start anywhere else? Right. Well, the head. Okay. Anywhere else. Right. And, and so I went through this process with him. And then when he finally got his birdhouse done, I said, Cougar, I want you to write all of the lessons that you learned today on this birdhouse. And you're going to call it your lesson birdhouse. Right. And so he's got this birdhouse in his room that has quality and gravity and more than one way to skin a cat and different principles that he was learning as he went through. And then he's he's added other lessons that he's learned in his life to this birdhouse. And I tell this story in my class talking about quality. And the students might like I'm not showing them what good quality looks like necessarily. But they're probably going to remember that more than if I was saying, OK, do you see that seam in the drywall? Uh, they'll figure those things out. But being able to share things like that with students that I think will help them become better people and be able to challenge their thought and to challenge their character going forward to say, what can I do that's good going forward? And what does my quality look like? Um, that's something that's rewarding to me. So from the student perspective, I can imagine that they can fully understand this example, right? With you and your son building mm -hmm. a birdhouse and, you know, quality essentially at the core of it, like you were teaching your son, is that, um, you know, is the job complete, right? Is it done right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many aspects of that as opposed to maybe just looking at the blemish that you may see from far away. What are some of the classes that the students gravitate to the most? Do you give feedback? To, I mean, how do you monitor the curriculum to know what's having the biggest impact and that the students really enjoy yeah, so we do senior exit interviews. I'm in that process right now with our graduating seniors where they kind of come and, and they'll share some of their favorite classes. Um, and a lot of those classes are uh, the ones that kind of stand out a lot is the project management class. Um, a lot of them really enjoy that class because it, it pulls everything together from the program for them. The company management class where they're learning about the business and how the business is set up and how it runs. Um, one that comes up a lot is actually the electrical class because it's a hands-on class where they get to actually figure out how something works. Um, they love the electrical lab. We have them wire switches and outlets and, and lights and three-way switches and four-way switches just to help them understand how electricity works, how to help manage electricians on projects as well so that they can speak the language. But they love being able to know how to do something and have confidence after they've done it, right? When they can wire something and say, hey, look, this three-way and four-way switch works. And, and that really builds confidence. And I think that's with anything in the industry is – giving those people that self-efficacy to say, I can do this, right? And that goes along with the training discussion that we were talking about is if companies can train them to where they feel confident, say, I can do this skill and, and I'm good at it, they feel great. They enjoy that, right? They love being able to be a part of something that they feel like they're good at. Yeah, I think most of us would. I mean, from the confidence side, how, how does it change when you see a student come in as a freshman to a senior, you know, with the leadership roles? And, and maybe speak to this aspect. What's unique about the program is, you know, the competition team and mm -hmm. the opportunities to lead and be voted in. I mean, how does that work from leadership in the organization as well as outside of it when you're competing against other universities at IBS and how that can prepare them for future employment as well? Yeah, that's that's something that's been really fun to watch as well, because I, I teach the intro level classes and I also teach some senior level classes and to see the growth of the students and their confidence grow over those four years is, is really phenomenal. And so, especially those that get involved in the program, um, when they go out and do their internships, they come back with more confidence in, in terms of the language and that they can perform in their abilities. 
but we have opportunities for them. We have different competitions that they can be a part of where if they invest in themselves and in their time, um, they get to build teams, right? They work as teams, they're competing. Um, we have the NAHB competition that's at the IBS. We also have an Associated Schools of Construction competition that's done every year in Reno that um, students compete in. And so they get to use and apply the knowledge that they're learning in class and their internships and be able to put it into practice. And for that, it becomes real to them. And as they do that, that confidence that, hey, I used what I did in class and now I just put it into a proposal that I'm going to go present that confidence just continues to build and it accelerates their classroom experience as well as they go through that. And then, and those are the leaders, right? The ones that uh, most companies are looking for are those students that are willing to invest in themselves and put that time in to be on those competition teams that are optional. And it can get competitive, right? Where there's only six spots on a team and we've got 440 students in the program, they have to show that they're willing to put in that work to get on a team. And oftentimes we'll have industry partners help interview those students to help select the teams. And then industry partners are helping to coach them to where they're getting some extra skill sets as well. I, I love that you brought up the get involved, right? And I, I think for any of your students that may be listening, and I, I think in general from a business owner aspect is that you know, when I'm looking at hiring, you know, I look at if I were to hire out of the university, there's no doubt, you know, some of the students that are super involved and they don't have to be and they're going above and beyond. And, you know, these are all things that are outside the call of duty. And I look at this to, to my team. I mean, I have employees that, again, social media is not a requirement. And I have some that are really involved that are looking to build the AFT brand and mm -hmm. building a community and doing all kinds of. And, and there's some that maybe not on social media, but they're spending time tutoring and helping and mentoring other people in the organization those things stick out, you know, as an employer, you know, that's, that's what we look for that, not just the competition aspect, but the involvement, the willingness. I remember as an employee working for a company just out of college and um, there were a couple of coworkers that you would ask for their help on something. They're like, this isn't my scope. I'm not helping you. And mm -hmm. it's just weird, you know, that they're just very much yeah. like, here's my blinders. That's what I'm doing. I'm showing up, I'm leaving. But at the end of the day, when times get tough and, you know, employers look at the big picture, you know, who the team players are, if you will, and it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I preach a lot to my students, what I call the STP principle. And it's the same 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, same 10 people show up to everything, right? They're the ones that are willing to get involved. They're the ones that clean up after. They're the ones that set up before. They're the ones that are willing to take on the hard responsibilities and you know, whether it's community assignments, whether it's religious assignments, whether it's, you know, school, I can count on those 10 people. And I always try and tell the students, be one of the 10, right? Or be number 11, get out there and, and show up. I've had students that get job offers because they simply showed up to an information, information session where a company was coming to talk about their company and that company had brought dinner and that student just helped clean up the dinner afterwards and helped them take their stuff out to their car. And the company's like, you want a job? And <laughs> it was just because they showed up. Um, they, they showed that they were willing to do things that they didn't have to do. Um, and that's a really important principle that I try and teach our students is, is to get out there and get involved in things that you don't have to do. Right. Um, my dad, and, and you'll probably remember this, he, he gives all of his students a card and I, I've continued on with this tradition um, with my students is at the end of the class, I'll give them a card that says, you got to want to. And I tell my students, if there's only three, three words that you remember anything about me and my class, I hope it's these three words is you got to want to. And really what it boils down to is attitude. And that's something that my dad taught me all growing up. And it's kind of my family motto with my children is if you change your attitude from I have to do something to I want to do something, everything's easier. If you say, I want to go to work instead of I have to go to work, 
or I want to get this report done instead of I have to get this report done, or I want to do my homework instead of I have to do my homework, everything changes, right? Um, I want to play with my kids instead of I have to play with my kids, right? Whatever aspect in life, we can't always control our situations. We can control our attitude. And being able to have students that have that you got to want to attitude, and I'm hoping that they'll catch that vision as they go forward and, and be one of those 10 people because they want to be, right? They want to help a company advance and, and not just be there to collect a paycheck, but to say, I want to make a difference, right? And, and having that you got to want attitude is something that I hope that our students will take away. Well, I think it's not just students. I think any of us listen, I got to want to, I think that's applicable to all of us. For mm -hmm. the, the students there with the internships, is that a requirement for them? I mean, do you push them to work for different companies each summer? I mean, how does the internship program work? Yeah, so our students have to do at least 300 hours of work experience in the construction industry. So it's not a regimented um, set internship requirement. They can work during school, they can work during the summers, but it just has to be something related to construction. So um, companies that might not have a formal internship program and they just wanna hire a student for help, they can definitely do that. And that would count towards the student's internship requirement. Students will often use their summers and a lot of them might do internships for multiple companies, especially if they're kind of on the fence, whether they wanna do residential or commercial. I always encourage them, now's a great testing period, right? Go out and try those different things where it's a test for your companies that you're hiring. They're testing you and you're testing them. And you're also seeing which part of the, or which sector of the industry that you want to be in. And so some of them will try working for subcontractors. Some of them will do trades. I try and encourage, especially our younger students, if they've never had experience in the trades, to go get some of that experience, because I think that's the most valuable thing that they can do that will inform their decisions for the rest of their career. Uh, I always tell them like, you're never gonna be 30 or 35 years old and be like, you know what? I'm gonna go frame for a summer. <laughs> that, that's gonna feel awesome on my body, right? Um, but when you're 20, you can go do it, right? And you can, you can work hard and you can be out in the elements and you can, put in a hard day's work and recover really quickly. When you're 35 and 40, it's it's a little harder, right? I'm still hurting from my, my football game last <laughs> night, but um, I try and get them to get some type of trade experience if possible. And some companies, they just want our students and they're like, hey, we'll give you management experience. And I'm like, I'd rather you give them trade experience uh, early on. And then as the juniors and seniors get up there, then then giving them that management experience is, is a little bit more beneficial for them. But yeah, our students, they, they get some work experience going through the program. I, I love employees that have worked as trades or have that experience. What's interesting is this is, there, there was no strategy, I just didn't know. So as a kid, I, when you speak about electrical class, that's one of my favorite, I grew up as an electrician. Mm -hmm. you know, So I grew up in the trades working. And over the summers, I worked as a trade going back every summer back in San Diego. So I didn't have the traditional, not that it's traditional, but I didn't go work for like a commercial or residential mm -hmm. GC. It was all trade related. And so when I went and when I was up in campus, I worked doing ins uh, installation as well. So that insulation, electrical, low voltage, fire alarm, all yeah. these different aspects. And But it's given me great perspective as a business owner because I remember those days too where, hey, let's be realistic. There's days when it was cold outside and you're like, I don't know if I'm super motivated to get out of this truck. You yep. know, and uh, am I having some personal strife from my sore for my football game last night? Am I ready to go climb the ladder or climb under the house? And so sometimes there's some empathy of how we can motivate to, you know, a labor force that is dealing with other things and physical labor is tough. And here in Phoenix, it's hot. And you grew up yeah. in Arizona, you know how these summers I, are. And so I did. My my dad time. was wise. He uh, he had a construction company down in Yuma, Arizona. <laughs> that's even hotter than Phoenix. And I dug holes in the summer um, from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. I would dig holes. I would dig two holes a day for two days. And then on the third day, we were replacing water main line valves and we would dig two holes. And I'm like, why can't we do this with a backhoe or something? He's like, nope, we got to do it by hand. And 
I, I call it the ultimate character building, right? And I just kind of kept asking my dad, like, why don't you have me in the office? I'm not going to be doing this, right? I'm not going to be digging holes. And he, he was wise. And he said, you need to learn an appreciation for the workers. You need to understand what they're going through. And probably the frustrating part was my dad at the time, he was the president of this company that had seven different companies within it. And he would be out laying sewer pipe sometimes with the crews in his nice pants. And my mom would get mad at him because he'd come home with glue on his pants. But <laughs> he, he would go out and you'd see him and you're like, he, this guy's laying sewer pipe with the crews. And you're like, well, I can't complain if he's doing it. And it just showed so much respect um, that he appreciated. And his workers would often say, why are you doing this? You're the boss. And he says, I'm showing it because I'm not above it, but I want you to also know I can get out of this, right? And and he would offer education to his crews. Um, he he would offer, like we had a community college down in Arizona, and he said that he would pay for their college education as long as they got a C or higher. He would cover their cost, um, and he only had one person take him up on it, but he was willing to do that and to help people better, but but the fact that he was willing to work and understood what they were going through taught me some valuable lessons and being in the trades and having that appreciation for the workers is something that I think as a manager is invaluable. Even, even when I was younger and he had a construction company, he would often, uh, they were a general contractor and he would often go to his electrician and say, okay, you've got me for one day this month. You want me to pull wire, I'll pull wire. You you tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And he was a business owner. Um, and, you know, he had quite a few houses or commercial buildings going at a time. And he would take a day out of his month to work with a trade so that he could understand what they were doing and better understand what, what they did. And he would have his tool belt on and, you know, and it was, it was kind of impressive to me to, to see how important the trades are and, and how much we need to value them. Well, I love that you instill and teach, you know, the, the students there and remind them of these experiences your dad taught you as, as a young kid as well. It's funny because I remember one of the stories he said when I was up there that had a big impact as far as like management. He said that he had an employee and, you know, like a lot of some of us in construction have a, mm -hmm. you know, not a big vocabulary, pretty foul mouth. And like every other word was a four letter expletive and uh, they were in front of clients. And so mm -hmm. he recorded him speaking and then they were driving together and he just played it for him and he never said anything. He just played it so that the employee could hear how he spoke. And he said he, mm -hmm. he quit cursing right after that. I thought that was kind of an interesting um, way to approach it, but for you, Justin, I know you're, you're, you're a busy man there on campus and you've been really gracious with your time today. So outside of football and dominating <laughs> the young kids in flag football and intramurals, what do you do for fun? Uh, I dominate them in racquetball. <laughs> um, one of the other faculty has put a $100 price on my head for any student that can beat me in racquetball. <laughs> um, so... I'm going on three years without having lost to a student. That's impressive. It's, it's been fun. Um, racquetball, I play basketball with the students on Friday. I'm in the intramural flag football league with them. I think I'm the oldest person in the league by quite a ways. <laughs> and then uh, I have six children, and so their, their events take up a lot of time. Uh, I've coached some of their sporting events. I I've, I've go and watch a lot of sporting events. And, and I, I just, I absolutely love what I do. I love being at BYU. I love the students. Um, I always say, you know, there's times where it's seven o'clock on a Friday and I think, oh, I should go home. Um, I, I love being around the students and the impact that I feel like they make on me and I make on them. And I, I've, I've had many of them in my home and the impact that they make on my children is, is super valuable for me as well. So. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And for those listening, I, I think many professors out there align with you, Justin, and, and many universities, and there's a lot of talent that's out there, you know, that are, that are engaged. And even more now, they, they see the, there's opportunity in the trades and opportunity in construction. And so I appreciate you prepping them for us. So where can uh, those listening find you? Uh, yeah, so um, 
my my email is Justin Weedman, J U S T I N W E I D M A N at BYU.edu. Um, so just in the BYU Construction and Facilities Management Program. Uh, also on Instagram at Justin Earl Weedman as well. And so, um, yeah, happy to reach out and connect with anybody that, that has questions about uh, students or education or, or what we can do to help your companies and, and your businesses. So. And if you're looking to hire some great talent, just email Justin and he'll connect you with some great students up there. So, so Justin, thank you. Appreciate you making time today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. If you give value from the show, please support us by giving a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you listen to. And I also have a favor to ask. We've had some incredible guests that come on and share their wisdom, their knowledge about their business. So if you have friends or family members that could benefit from those episodes, please share it with them, as well as any other business owners that you're networking with that could get value from the podcast or certain episodes. Please share those as well. Again, subscribe, make sure you're following any questions that you have, topics, We've had uh, listeners reach out about certain guests that we should have on the show. Again, brad.l at aftconstruction.com. Email me for topics to address, guests that we should have on, and even if you think you'd be a great guest for the show. So again, thank you for all your support, and we'll see you next time.